Hey guys, Reaper the Rage here. Hope you're having a fantastic day, and welcome to a brand new series on the channel that I'm going to be calling Reaper Reads. Um, this is a series where I find a book. Um, I'm not a big reader myself, even though I I, I don't hate reading. I just um, basically I don't really watch TV and I don't really read and I don't really do anything but game. That's my thing. That's my thing. Is like I sit down and when I have spare time, it's in games or it's in editing, and I do you know stuff focused on video games. Um, but I do like to read. Uh, so my my love of reading, well, not really my love, but sort of my interest in reading was rekindled a few months ago when I happened to be at um, uh, the DMV and they had this little table of books and I found something by John Connolly called The Gates. Now, I've already read that through, so I'm not going to read it here, um, but it was just a really nice thing. It read kind of like um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. and It was kind of entertaining. Um, and I was going to read another book called Skyward or Skyfront, something like that. Um, which which caught my eye at a bookstore, and I bought it, but I've misplaced it. <laughs> so instead, today, I found something at Goodwill, the full series, mind you, hardback, of Ted Decker's Green. Now, I don't know if you guys are seeing this or if I've done some fancy editing and shotcut for a background. Um, I might have, but just in case, you know, here's the book, and it's called Green. Now, this is the Circle, this is part of the Circle series of books, and it is book zero, so it's the beginning and the end. So apparent, So according to what the thing says on the inside cover it says that this is actually a fully circular series of books so the first book is the last book is the first book so it just keeps going around um so if you read all the other books once you're done with the series you come back and read the first book and it wraps everything up as the it's the both the first and the fourth book it's it's weird um but this is by ted decker apparently a bestseller and according to this um as for the the back here i'm gonna go ahead and read the description here as foretold by ancient prophets, an apocalypse destroyed Earth during the 21st century, but 2,000 years later, Elion set upon the Earth a new Adam. This time, however, he gave humanity an advantage. What was once unseen became seen. It was good, and it was called green. But the evil Tele bided his time in a black forest. Then, when least expected, a 24-year-old named Thomas Hunter fell asleep in our world and woke up in that future black forest. A gateway was opened for Tele to ravage the land. Devastated by the ruin, Thomas Hunter and his circle swore to fight the dark scourge until their dying breath. But now the circle has lost hope. Samuel, Thomas Hunter's cherished son, has turned his back on his father. He gathers the dark forces to wage a final war. Thomas is crushed and desperately seeks a way back to our reality to find the one elusive hope that can save them all. Enter an apocalyptic story like none you have read. A story with links to our own history so shocking that you will forget you are in another world at all. Welcome to Green, Book Zero. There's four novels, two worlds, and one story. So that's basically it. Um, I'm going to try and keep this video to like 20 minutes like I did with The Blind Griffin. I feel like when I'm reading something, that's about the most I want to be reading when there's nothing engaging. Um, so if I was doing something like Undertale, for instance, there'd be something else engaging. You're looking around, you're exploring the world, um, and you're also reading because it's, uh, it doesn't have voice acting. But in like a visual novel, you're not really doing much. And so like with this reading, I'm not really doing much. So I want to keep it as short as possible, but I still want enough um, stuff in it. So we'll, we'll see how far we get in 20 minutes. And uh, I guess we'll go ahead and begin. Open it up here. Very nice cover, by the way. Um, so if I open it up, we have the beginning. Or, well, the beginning and the end. Uh, in times past, our history has been retold using simple metaphors. Light coming into darkness, a land called Narnia set free by a lion, a ring that would enslave the hearts of all. But our generation looks to a new mythology to peel back the layers of truth. Dive deep into a world of colors of green, of black, of red, and of white. So this is still kind of the, um, the author's prologue here. Uh, according to the books of history, everything that happened following the year 2010 actually began in the year 4036 AD. It began in the future, not the past. Earth had been destroyed once during the, first 20th cent during the 21st century. An apocalypse foretold by the prophets, but the time for history was not yet finished, and Elon, in his great wisdom, set upon the earth a new firstborn named Tanis. This time, Elon gave humans an advantage. This time, what was once spiritual and unseen became physical and seen. So I'm thinking something kind of like in The Legend of Korra or Avatar The Last Airbender, where you have like the spirit realm mixing with the human realm. That's, court of, that's sort of, I think that's what they're getting at here. Uh, all that was good and evil could be watched and touched. The Rush and the great lions roamed the forest. Humans knew no pain, no fear, no sadness, and everywhere was the color of intoxicating pleasure of Elion himself. Uh, yet evil also remained. 
Tile and his minions bided their time in a black forest, and that time came. Well, at least expected. Okay, so this is this is sort of the uh, back cover again. So I'm not going to continue reading because this is just basically the back cover again with a few extra words thrown in. Um, so this is the actual prologue here. <clears throat> According to the books of history, everything that happened after the year 2010 actually began in the year 4036 AD. It began in the future, not the past. Confusing, perhaps, but perfectly understandable once you realize that some things are as dependent on the future as on the past. The world's history was written in the books of history, those magnificent volumes that recorded only the truth of all that happened. Earth was destroyed once during the 21st century. In an apocalypse foretold in the books of the ancient prophets Daniel and John, then recorded as history in the books of history. But the time for history was not yet finished, and Elion and his great wisdom set upon the earth, blah blah blah. We've seen this kind of before. Uh, so the blind. As time. Alright. Uh, what had been spiritual and unseen became physical and seen. All good and evil could be watched and felt and touched and tasted. As time passed, however, mankind closed its eyes to what was real and became blind to the forces that surrounded it. But there remained a small band of rebels who longed to see Elion as they once had. They were led by one man who claimed to have visited the 21st century in his dreams. His name was Thomas Hunter. This is his story. Okay, so we have Zero, the future. Shelley's Hunter, wife of Thomas Hunter, stood beside her son Samuel and gazed over the canyon now flooded with those who'd crossed the desert for the annual gathering. The sound of pounding drums echoed from the cliff walls. Thousand, thousands milled in groups or danced in small circles as they w awaited the final ceremonies, which would commence when the sun settled beyond the horizon. The night would fall, or the night would fill. Apologies. The night would fill with cries of loyalty, and all would feast on fatted cows in hopes for deliverance from their great enemy, the horde. Ooh, so we have an enemy here. But Samuel, a warrior with a heavy sword and angry glare, had evidently put his hope in something entirely different. He stood still. But she knew that under the leather chest and shoulder armor, his muscles were tense and, in his mind's eye, moving already, racing off to make war. Chalice let the breeze blow her hair about her face and tried to calm herself with steady breathing. This is impossible, Samuel. Complete foolishness, is it? Say that to Sakura. She would agree with me. Oh, God, I'm already changing the voices here. Uh, Sakura, mother of three just a few days earlier, was now mother of two. Her 15-year-old son, Richard, had been caught and hung by a horde scouting party when he'd strangled, straggled behind his tribe as it made its way to the gathering. Then she's the fool, not me. You think our non-violent ways are... Wait, I don't know who's talking now. Hold on. <laughs> you, you think our non-violent ways are just as... Just a haphazard strategy to gain us the upper hand, Chilis demanded. You think returning death with more death will bring us peace? Nearly everyone in the valley was once horde, including me, in case I need to remind you. Now you want to hunt their families because they haven't converted to our ways? And you would let them slaughter us instead? How many of us do they need to kill before you shed this absurd love you have for our enemy? So, apparently this horde seems to be made up of people, and it's not really an evil enemy that's its own culture, it seems to just be sort of a ravenous band of, I'd say, tribesmen, or uh, sort of raiders, if you will. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Chilis could talk his back talk no longer, or Chilis could take his back talk no longer. It took all of her strength to resist the temptation to slap his face here and now. Go for it, girl, I got you. <laughs> But it occurred to her that using violence at precisely this moment would strengthen his point, and knowing Samuel, he would only grin. Uh, she knew how to fight, they all did as a matter of tradition, but next to Samuel, she was the butterfly and he the eagle. Chelsea settled. For the sake of Jake, her youngest, they must follow the ways of Elion. For the sake of her father, Kurong, commander of the Horde, and her mother, ooh, so she's like the princess of the Horde, uh-oh, uh, and her mother. For the sake of the world, they had to cling to what they knew, not what their emotions demanded from them. To take up arms now would make an unforgivable mockery of all the circle stood for. So it seems the circle is, I guess, something that broke off from the Horde and has become its own thing. And they're trying to be better and not be evil raiders in an apocalyptic world. They're trying to build civilization. They're trying to make something better. So that's kind of cool. <clears throat> 
She faced Samuel and saw that his sleeve was hitched up under his left arm guard. She pulled it down and brushed it flat. Todd, I know, she said, casting a glance back at the three mounted guards who waited behind them. Samuel's band numbered a couple dozen, all sharing his hatred. Honorable men who were tired of seeing loved ones die at the hands of the Horde. He's larger than... He's larger than life, we all know that. Just because you're his son doesn't mean you have to blaze his trail. She'd meant to console him, but he stiffened and she knew her words had done the opposite. Not that you feel like you have to measure up to Thomas, but... This has nothing to do with Thomas. He snapped, pulling away. Nobody could possibly... Uh... Nobody could possibly measure up to a man with his past. My concern is the future, not some crazy history bounding between the worlds through those dreams of his. So that's referring to Thomas and his ability to go between, I guess, he's in the future dreaming of the past and vice versa. So it's kind of like a back and forth thing. And he's got sort of like a gift. <clears throat> Odd that he would refer to the time when Thomas claimed to have traveled back in time through dreams. Thomas so rarely referred to it himself these days. Forget his, forget his dreams. My husband is the leader of the circle. He carries the burden of keeping 12,000 hearts in line with the truth, and you, his son, would undermine that. Samuel's jaw nodded. The truth, mother? He bit off. He shoved a hand south in the direction of Korangi Forest. Once controlled by Thomas and the Forest Guard, now inhabited by her father, leader of the Horde, Korong. The truth is, your precious Horde hates us and butchers us wherever they find us. What do you suggest? Run off now on the eve of our great celebration in search of a few scabs who are likely back in the city by now? Samuel lowered his hand and looked back at his men, then to the south again. We have him now. You have who now? The scab who killed Sakura's son. We have him captive in a canyon. Chelsea didn't know what to say to this. They had taken a scab captive? Who'd ever heard of such a thing? We're going to give him a trial in the desert, Samuel said. For what purpose? For justice! You cannot kill him, Samuel. The gathering would come undone. I don't have to tell you what that would do to your father. To my father? He looked at her. Or to you, mother, the daughter of Korong, supreme commander of all that is wicked and vile. Chelsea slapped him. Ooh, nothing more than a flat palm to his cheek, but the crack of the blow sounded like a whip. Samuel grinned. She immediately wished to take her anger back. So it seems this circle, from what I'm, from what I'm gathering so far, the circle seems to be a, uh, like a bunch of people that come together during this gathering. And there, I guess there are a bunch of like separate tribes that come together and declare like peace and are trying to work together. And they don't seem, and it seems sort of like a non-aggression pact. Um, but if he does like all this with the horde and all that, then it's going to risk war. Interesting. Sorry, sorry, I didn't mean that, but you're speaking of my father. Yes, you did mean that, mother. He turned and strode toward his horse. Where are you going? To conduct a trial, he said. Then at least bring him in, Samuel. She started after him, but he was already swinging into the saddle. Think! I'm done thinking. He pulled his horse around and brushed past his men, who turned with him. It's time to act. Samuel, keep this t between us, will you? He said, looking over his shoulder. I'd hate to put a damper on such a wonderful night of celebration. Samuel, stop this! He kicked his horse and left her with the sound of pounding, pounding hooves. Dear Elion, the boy would be ruin of them all. Wow, I'm I'm 14 minutes <laughs> into this recording. I'm not going to count like the first four minutes, so we're really only 10 minutes in, but that's not bad. Um, but yeah, the, the first like four minutes were me just talking. Um, <clears throat> so now we have one. We've gone from zero to one. So these are broken up in not really chapters. These are more like nine to ten page sections. Um, I guess they could be considered chapters, but they're not being called chapters. So I'm just going to refer to them as sections. So section one. Uh, Thomas Hunter stood next to his wife, Chalice, facing the... Chalice? I keep saying Chalice or Chalice? I, I don't know. Chalice. Facing the shallow canyon lined by 3,000 of Elion's lovers who drowned in the Red Lakes to rid their bodies of the scabbing disease that covered the skin of all Horde. Interesting. So there's like a disease on the Horde. But I guess it can be cured by Elion. The reenactment of the Great Wedding had taken an hour, and the final salute, which would usher the gathering into a wild night of celebration, was upon them. 
As was customary, both he and Chilis were dressed in white, because Elion would come in white. She with lilies in her hair and a long flowing gown spun from silk. He, in a bleached tunic, dyed red around the collar to remind them of the blood that had paid for, his w for this wedding. Okay. This was their great romance, and there could not possibly be a dry eye in the valley. Six maidens also in white faced... In, in white, faced Shalise and Thomas on their knees and sang the great wedding song. Their sweet, yearning voices filled the valley as they cried the refrain in melodic unison, faces bright with an eager desperation. You are beautiful, so beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I have an itch on my arm. <laughs> Not to ruin the mood. <clears throat> the drums lifted the cry to a crescendo. Millis, one of the older children, had recounted their history earlier in the night to thundering applause. Now Thomas retraced from his own vantage all that had brought them here. Interesting. Ten years ago, most of these people had been whored, enslaved by Tillet's disease. The rest were forest dwellers who had kept the disease at bay by washing in Elion's lakes once every day as he directed. Then the horde, led by Kurong, had invaded the forest and defiled the lakes. All had succumbed to the scabbing disease, which deceived the mine and cracked the skin. Ooh. But Elion made a new way to defeat the evil disease. Any horde simply had to drown in one of the red pools, and the disease would be washed away, never to return. Those who chose to drown and find new life were called albinos by the horde, because their skin, whether dark or light, was smooth. The albinos formed a circle of trust and followed their leader, Thomas of Hunter. Okay. Um, so, there's like a disease, and then they drown. So, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing this whole drowning thing is sort of a callback to the real world, our world, which is, which we have like, um, uh, baptisms, which clean the skin and all that. But we do that, it's like spiritual, and it's kind of just a metaphor and but in this they literally baptize them and make them like cured of the disease that's kind of cool the horde however divided into two races purebred horde who'd always had the scabbing disease and half breeds who'd been forest dwellers but turned horde after kurong's invasion of the forests the full bred horde despised and persecuted the half breeds because they'd once been forest dwellers iram uh, or iram a half-breed, had fled Kurong's persecution, welcomed all half-breeds to join him in the deep northern desert, where they thrived as Horde and the enemies of Kurong. Nearly half a million, rumor had it. Wow, that's a lot of people. They called the faction who followed them, who followed Eram, Eramites, remnants of the faithful who were as diseased as any other scab, all suffered from the sickly, smelly disease that covered the skin and clouded the mind. Thomas glanced at his bride. To look at Shalisa's smooth bronze jaw now, her bright emerald eyes had once been gray, her long blonde hair had once been tangled dreadlocks, smothered in morsed paste to fight the stench of the scabbing disease. Ch Chalice, who'd given birth to one of his three children, was a vision of perfect beauty, and in so many ways they were all perfectly beautiful, as Elion was beautiful, 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 beautiful. They had all once denied Elion, their maker, their lover, the author of the great romance. Now they were the Circle, roughly 12,000 who lived in nomadic tribes, fugitives from the Horde hunters who sought their deaths. I hate this book cover. It keeps slipping. I might just take it off. Um, sought their deaths. 3,000 had come together northwest of Kurangi City in a remote, shallow canyon called Parados. They did this every year to express their solidarity and celebrate their passion for Elion, the gathering they called it. This year, four gatherings would take place near four forests, one north, one south, one east, one west. The danger of all 12,000 crossing the desert from where they had scattered and coming to one location was simply too great. Okay, so now instead of having everybody come together and risk everything, they're having little chapters of gatherings happening, you know, like four different locations. Thomas scanned the 3,000 strewn the 3,000 strewn along the rocks and on the earth in a huge semicircle before him. After three days of late nights and long days filled with laughter and dancing and innumerable embraces of affection, they now stared at him in wide-eyed silence. A large bonfire raged to his left, casting shifting shadows over their intent gazes. 
To his right, the red pool glistened, black in the night, one of 77 they'd found throughout the land. Cliffs surrounded the hidden canyon, broken only by two gaps wide enough for four horses abreast. Guards lined the tops of the cliffs, keeping a keen eye on the desert beyond for any sign of horde. How many times over the past ten years had members of the circle been found and slaughtered wholesale? Too many to count. But they had learned well, gone deep, tracked the horde's movements, become invisible in the desert canyons. So invisible that the scabs now often referred to the circle as ghosts. But Thomas now knew that the greatest danger no longer came from the horde. Treachery was brewing inside the circle. A horse snorted from the corrals around the bend behind Thomas. The fire popped and crackled as hungry flames lapped at the shimmering waves of heat they chased into the cool night air. The breathing of several thousand bodies steadied in the magic of the maiden's song. Still, no sign of his elder son Samuel. An echo followed the last note, and silence fell upon the gathering. As the maidens backed slowly into the crowd, Thomas lifted his gray chalice, filled to the brim with Elion's red healing waters from the pool. As one, the followers of Elion lifted their chalices out to him, level with their steady gazes. The salute, their eyes held his, some defiant in their determination to stay true, many wet with tears of gratitude for the great sacrifice that had first turned the pools red. The leader stood to his left, Mikkel and Jameis, her husband, side by side, goblets raised, staring forward, waiting for Thomas. Susan, one of the many colored albinos, and her lover, Johan, who had been a mighty warrior, was a mighty warrior, gripped each other's hands and watched Thomas. Marie, his daughter from his first wife, who is now with Elion, stood next to his youngest child, Jake, who was five years old one month ago. Where had all the years gone? The last time he'd taken a breath, Marie had been 16. Now she was 25. A hundred boys would have wed her years ago if Thomas hadn't been so stuffy. As she put it, at 18, Marie had lost interest in boys and taken up scouting with Samuel. Her betrothal to Vidal, the dark-skinned man next to her, had occurred only after she abandoned her old passions. Samuel, on the other hand, still pursued his, with enough eagerness to keep Thomas pacing late into the night on occasion. And still, no sign of the boy. He'd been gone for a day. The circle waited, and he let the moment stretch to the snapping point. A presence here warmed the back of his neck with anticipation. They couldn't see him, hadn't seen him for many years, but Elion was near. Elion, as the boy, as the warrior, as the lion, the lamb, the giver of life and lover of all, their great romance was for him. He'd given his life for them, and they for him. They all wore the symbol that represented their own history, a medallion or a tattoo shaped like a circle, with an outer ring in green to signify the beginning, the life of Elion. Then a black circle to uh, remember evil's crushing blow. Two straps of red crossed the black circle, the death that brought life in the red waters, and at the, at the center a white circle, for it was prophesied that Elion would come again on a white horse and rescue his bride from the dragon Tele, who pursued her day and night. Soon, Thomas thought. Elion had to come soon. If he did not, they would fall apart. They'd been wandering in the desert for ten years, like lost Israelites without a home. At celebrations like this, surrounded by song and dance, they all knew the truth. But when the singing was over, how quickly they could forget. Still, he held them. Three minutes now, and not a man, woman, or child over the age of two spoke. Even the infants seemed to understand that they had reached the climax of the three-day celebration. Later, they would feast on the fifty boar they'd slaughtered and set over fires at the back of the canyon. They would dance and sing and boast of all things worthy and some not. But they all knew that every pleasure they tasted, every hope that filled their chests, every moment of peace and love rested firmly on the meaning behind the words that Thomas would now speak. His low voice flooded the canyon with an assurance that brought a tremble to their limbs. I need a drink. Give me a moment. Ugh. I've been reading for like 15 minutes straight. Okay. <clears throat> Lovers of Elion, who have drowned in the lakes and give, been given life, this is our hope, our passion, our only true reason to live. It is as he says, Chelsea said in a light voice choked with emotion. Together the 3,000 responded, He speaks the truth. Their soft voices rumbled through the valley. They knew Elion by many names, the creator who'd fashioned them, the warrior who'd once rescued them, the giver of gifts who gave them the fruit that healed and sustained them. 
but they'd agreed to simply call him Elion several years earlier, when a heretic from a southern tribe began to teach that Thomas himself was their savior. Oh, no, 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 no. Thomas is like the prophet leader dude, okay? But the fucking Elion is the god, all right? Let's get this straight. <laughs> Thomas spoke with more intensity. He has rescued us. He has woed us. He has lavished us with more pleasures than we can contain in this life. It is as he says, Chelsea said. The people's reply washed over Thomas like a wave gaining volume. He speaks the truth. Now we wait for the return of our king, the prince warrior who loved us while we were yet horde. It is as he says, he speaks the truth. So that's sort of like a chant they do. Our lives are his, born in his waters, made pure by the very blood we now raise to the sky. Thomas thundered each word. And Chelsea cried in her agreement, It is as he says, he speaks the truth. Their voices spilled over the canyon walls for any within a mile on this still night to hear. Remember Elion, brothers and sisters of the circle. Live for him, ready the bride, make a celebration ready, for he is among us. It is as he says. The volume rose to a crushing roar. He speaks the truth. I speak the truth. He speaks the truth. I speak the truth. He speaks the truth. Silence. Drink to remember, to the great romance, to Elion. This time their response was whispered in utmost reverence, as if each syllable was something as precious as the red water in their hands. To Elion. Thomas closed his eyes, brought the chalice to his lips, tilted it back, and let the cool water flow into his mouth. The red liquid swirled around his tongue, then seeped down his throat, leaving a lingering copper taste. He let the gentle effects of the first few drops warm his belly for a second, then swallowed deep, flooding his mouth and throat with the healing waters. They weren't nearly as strong as the green lake waters that had once flowed with Elion's presence, and they did not contain the same medicinal qualities of the fruit that hung from the trees around the pools, but they lifted spirits and brought simple pleasure. He took three full gulps of the precious water, allowing them to spill down his chin. Then pulled the chalice away, cleared his throat with one final swallow, and gasped at the night sky. To Elion! As one, the circle poured their goblets from their mouths like parched warriors satisfied by sweet ale and roared into the night. To Elion! And with that cry, the spirit of celebration was released. Thomas turned to Chalice, drew her to him with his free arm, and kissed her wet lips. A thousand, cry a thousand voices cried their approval, chased by undulating calls from the unwed maidens and their hopeful suitors. Chalice's laughter filled his mouth as he spun back to the crowd, goblet still raised. He pulled her forward so all could see his bride. Is there anyone here who would dare not love as Elion has loved us all? Can anyone not remember the disease that covered their flesh? Thomas looked at Chalice and spoke his poetic offering around a subtle grin that undoubtedly failed to properly express his love for this woman. What beauty, what pleasure, what intoxicating love he has given for me for my own ashes, in place of the stench that once filled my very nostrils, he has given me this fragrance, a princess whom I can serve. She numbs my mind with dizzying pictures of exquisite beauty. They all knew he was speaking of Chalice, who had been the princess of the Horde, Karong's very own daughter. Now she was the bride of Elion, Thomas's lover, the bearer of his youngest son, who stared up at them with wonder next to Marie. He speaks the truth. <clears throat> he speaks the truth, Johann said, grinning. He took a pull from his goblet and dipped his head. He speaks the truth, they returned, followed by more calls and rounds of drinks. Johann, too, had been whored not so long ago, charged with killing hundreds, thousands by the time it was all over, of Elion's followers. Thomas thrust his goblet toward the gathering, unmindful of the liquid that splashed out. There were seventy-seven pools filled with the red waters, and not one had ever shown any sign of going dry. Wow, that is a lot of juice. Like, that's, that's a lot of tropical juice, my dudes. <clears throat> to the horde! To the horde! And they drank again, flooding themselves with the intoxicate. Thought we were talking about Elyon's dudes, now we're talking about the horde? Okay, a little confused. And they drank again, flooding themselves with the intoxicating waters in a start to what promised to be a night of serious, unrestricted celebration. Aye, father! The male voice came from behind and to his right, the husky, unmistakable sound of Samuel. To the horde! 
Thomas lowered his chops and turned to see his son perched atop his horse, drilling him with his bright green eyes. He rode low in the pale stallion saddle and moved with the horse as if he'd been bred and born on the beast. His dark hair fell to his shoulders, blown by a hard wind, or hard ride. Sweat had mixed with the red mud that he and those of his band applied to their cheekbones. Streaks etched his darkened face and neck. His leather chest guard was open, allowing the night air to cool his bared chest, still glistening in the moonlight. Oh, I have a sneaking suspicion that he's about to bring that guy that he talked about, the scab that they captured. I feel like they're about to like bring him into the celebration and have the trial right there so that they can steal the show. I, I, I've seen this trope a little too much for like the bad guy to show up. Well, he's not really the bad guy. I don't know. We don't know if he's the bad guy yet. He's kind of just misguided. Anyway, <clears throat> back to it. He had his mother's nose and eyes. A stab of pride sliced through Thomas's heart. Samuel might have gone astray, but this image of his boy could have been him 15 years ago. The stallion's clip-clopping hooves echoed as it stepped into the firelit firelight, followed by three, then five, then nine warriors who'd taken up arms with Samuel. All were dressed in the same battle dress to the forest guard, largely abandoned since the circle had laid down arms 11 years ago. So they're pacifists, it seems. The circle seems to be pacifists, is, is what we're getting at. They love love thy neighbor, be pa don't, don't fight people, all that good, you know, hippy-dippy stuff. Um, let's see. Uh, only the guards and scouts wore the protective leathers to ward off arrows and blades. But Samuel, no amount of reason seemed to jar good sense into his thick skull. His son stilled his horse with a gentle tug on its reins. His followers stopped behind him in a loose formation that left them with no weak flank. Standard guard protocol by his own orders. Samuel and his band moved with the ease of seasoned warriors. A few catcalls from different points in the crowd raised praise for the man who scanned them without a hint of acknowledgement. Uh, Here, Samuel, Elion's strength boy. A pause. Keep the boogers in the stink hole, Samuel. So that's like people in the crowd like, yeah, go Samuel. Samuel's cool dude. Fucking saw, dude. <laughs> um, this remark was a departure from general sentiment, though not as distant from the heart of the circle as it once had been. Thomas was all too aware of the rumblings among many clans. Nice of you to join. Nice of you to join us, Samuel. Thomas said, tipping his chalice in the boy's direction. His son looked directly at Chalice, dipped his head, then looked back at the three thousand gathered in the natural amphitheater. To the horde, he called. To the horde! But only half took up the cry. The rest, like Thomas, heard the bite in Samuel's voice. To the stinking bloody horde who butcher our children and spread their filthy disease through our forests, Samuel cried, voice now bitter with mockery. Only a few took him up. Stinking bloody horde. Our friends, the horde, have sent their apologies for taking the life of our own three days ago. They have sent us all a gift to express their remorse, and I have brought it to our gathering. And here comes the captive guy. I called it. I totally called it. Samuel struck his hand out, palm up. A dark object sailed forward, lobbed by Petrus, son of Jeremiah. And Samuel snatched it out of the air as if it were a water bag needed to be refilled. He tossed it onto the ground. The object bounced once and rolled to stop where firelight illuminated the fine details of their praise. It was a head. A human head. A horde head with the mane of a long of long dreadlocks covered in disease. A chill snaked down Thomas' spine. This, he thought, was the beginning of the end. And that concludes the reading for today. So it seems that um it'll take it takes me about uh a half hour to get through a couple of these. So the first two I did zero and one and a little bit of talking, so that got me in there. I'm just checking to make sure it's kind of standard for them to be that, because they felt I felt kind of long. I don't know where's where's four at, because there's two, three, and then I'm looking. There's four. Okay, so yeah, I think we can do like two a day. Um, it might take a while to read through all these, not to mention this is only book one, so there's many more books. So expect this series to be on the channel for a long time to come. It's going to take us quite a bit if we do this once a week. Now, I may do it more um, if I'm feeling like reading it, but for right now, that is it for the reading. Um, so, so far, what we've learned is that there's a world, it's a 
apocalyptic. Thomas is the leader of the followers of, or of the circle, which follow Elyon, and they're like pacifists, and they're nice, and they don't really, they're not trying to attack the Horde, but the Horde is attacking them, and so Samuel, the son of Thomas, is fed up with that, so Samuel wants to go and attack the Horde and be a warrior and, and you know, get rid of them, which, I don't know, I kind of am starting to feel Samuel's point here. Like, if they're killing us, why don't we just kill all of them and get it over with? Because, like, if you kill all of them, then there won't be a Horde left, because then you'll have that, but I don't know. It depends. But there's also a second horde, which was like the albinos. Or not the, yeah, the, the like the half-breed guys that went off and like lived in the desert away from everybody. And they're the enemy of, of the real horde. So I don't know. It depends. It really depends. But that is it for this reading. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, then do the usual. Like, subscribe, check out my streams on Twitch. And I will see you guys in the next video. Reaper the Ranger, signing off.